Good morning. I'm recording this during the evening, so it's good evening for me, but good morning for you, good afternoon, whenever you're getting around to reading this, or, um, sorry, uh, viewing this. Um, <clears throat> this is my next video uh, that I'm using for my composition classes. It ordered help them write an argument paper, for those of you guys who are watching this that are not all that interested in composition, you're watching the wrong thing. Um, if you're part of my class, this is connected to the argument research paper, which you should be doing now. Um, had a couple people ask some questions, figured I would try to answer them in this venue. Uh, because it's a little bit easier than writing everything out, I will actually post the notes onto Blackboard along with some links that will help. Uh, I'm reading some of these notes off of my computer screen, which is next to the phone. So I'm going to be looking back and forth, of course. Um, but I want to cover a couple of specific things in this video. Uh, one, I want to talk about uh, structure. I want to talk about addressing the opposition, which is an integral piece that you must cover in this argument paper. Um, it'll also take up some space. So for those of you guys who are trying to and struggling to get to that uh, page limit, um, that will be part of this. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the formal tone and some of the reason that the research is there uh, and some of the reason that the research is as picky as it is. And then I want to talk a little bit about avoiding logical fallacies, uh, which is a part of this argument process. Uh, we'll talk about what logical fallacies are and how you can avoid uh, slipping into that particular kind of mistake. Um, I'm getting a lot of my resources to help with this from the Purdue OWL, the online writing page, the online writing lab. Um, that's kind of my go-to place for not only documentation and structure work in composition, but also for just about any writing, uh, formal writing question. So, I've included a link to the Purdue University Online Writing Lab, and one thing, especially if we're dealing with this distance learning piece, if you are struggling with something and you can't get an answer from me or from any of the school's tutors, write as quickly as you would like, uh, as you would like to get it. Please understand that you can check the Online Writing Lab, uh, you know, check, check the OWL, and a lot of times you can find some of these answers yourself. Um, getting through the rest of the semester when you didn't plan to take an online class, and here you are, you're going to have to be a bit more independent. And the best thing for you to do is to just kind of grab onto this and say, okay, I, I, I got to do this. I'm going to have to be more of an active learner than maybe I intended to be, but here I've got to do it. So let's get started. All right, so the argument research paper is a formal academic paper, as I'm sure you know. We've talked a little bit before about how this is a personal pronoun free paper. So that's going to change the tone of how I want you to write this. If you need to get it out of your system and just write this argument as something of a rant first, then clean it up, that helps for some people. Um, I've had people to ask me questions about how to deal with an argument that they feel is very emotional for them. It's something that they've taken on that's very personal. And I absolutely can and, and do understand that. There are some issues that we face that are almost too personal. They're too much for us to get our emotions out of the way to think rationally about them. Now, in those cases, you've got a couple of different choices. One, you can decide that this is too connected to me personally, I'm not going to be able to be objective about it, and I need to find a different topic because a grade is involved, because effectively this is my, this is something that is too big for me right now to deal with without getting super emotional. Um, or 
you can try to get some of that emotion out of your system by writing it out or by working it out in another way. And then when you hit the academic paper, you can write in a more objective fashion because you've given air and you've given freedom to some of your emotions to clear them out. Uh, neither of those is a bad idea. And I don't mind reading a more uh, angry or excited or sad or, or ranting paper if at the end I have a more formal professional paper. Okay, we choose our topics because we have a passion for them or because there's something we actually give a damn about. But we have to be able to do that in a professional way and that does not equate to a, a, an angry screaming, uh, even if it is something where that's genuinely how we feel. It's not effective arguing. It's very easy to dismiss somebody who has dropped into simply a pure emotional argument. In fact, one of the logical fallacies that I may mention later on is an appeal to emotion or an appeal to simple emotion, basically an appeal to pity. And it's not really a solid argument. It's just, wouldn't it be, is, isn't it sad that this is the case? Well, lots of things are sad, but they don't necessarily require or, or mandate action on somebody else's part just because it's sad. It's, it's really sad that, you know, my, my grandfather died at like 93 years old. It was really sad for me. And, and I still miss him. But he had his time. He had a good long life. There should... He, he's not necessarily... No crime happened. No, no injustice was, was done. No one should be required to do anything simply because I got emotionally damaged and emotionally hurt uh, that day. My whole family was very sad, as was a lot of things, but there was nothing wrong that was going on. We were just sad. It sucks. Um, so I can't write an argument paper with that type of an argument, like, isn't this sad? Does this make me angry? Everyone is pissed off. You may be right, but unless you can connect it in some other way, that, that anger, even if it's justified, just the anger is not a reason. It's a reaction. And those are two very different things. Okay, so let's take it a little more from the top here. Uh, structure. In... On Blackboard, I put together an outline uh, for the argument paper. Now, that is just one way to look at this and one way to do it. It's close very much to the uh, Rogarian uh, system, uh, but it is not the only way to do it. Now, the way that I've done it in there is to start with a uh, basically an introductory paragraph. And as I mentioned before, you don't need to feel that you have to write the... You don't need to feel that... You have to write the introduction first. Having a general idea as to where you're going first and then filling it in, fleshing it out later isn't a bad thing. If you've got a thesis statement, if you have the wording for a thesis statement, that's great. If you do not yet, but you know sort of what you're proving because you've written that proposal, you've gotten it approved, so you know that you're going to argue that uh, I need to... that that. English classes with Ben Martin need to be done uh, with more swords in the background rather than fewer swords in the background. So you may not have the exact wording down there, but you know, just you know, large numbers of swords are better. You can write an introduction that just kind of says, yeah, okay, you know, more swords in Martin's English classes. Okay? Then go on to the rest of the paper. Now, this outline 
after the introduction, after the thesis statement, the outline suggests that you're going to write your opposition and refutation next. Now you can play around with it, but the reason that I suggest that you'd get that out of the way is that your target for an argument paper, your target audience, is not people who already agree with you. It's people who don't. You are writing this as if you are writing to someone who sort of is that opposition or is at, at best ambivalent about your topic. Okay? So there's no point to arguing to convince someone who's already with you. Okay? You don't have to convince me that, uh, for example, the Trump administration has handled the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus outbreak poorly. I believe you. We're done. And when you provide reasons past that, there's a bit of like, yeah, you're right. Okay, we're on the bandwagon. And that bandwagon is not really getting us anywhere because we're not doing anything about the problem. Uh, we're both agreeing with each other, and this might be a great thing to hang out and have a, you know, have a drink over, just like, yeah, I agree. But we haven't accomplished anything because we're both at the same position we were at the end, at, at the beginning of this discussion. However, if I was going to take that position and talk to a diehard conservative or somebody who just really likes Donald Trump and didn't want to believe that, I have to provide some solid evidence and I might change this person's mind and then we've actually accomplished something. Okay, if that person wants to argue that Donald Trump did a gr great job and was really prepared and everything is going a lot better than it could have been under some other person's leadership, okay, you better provide me with some solid evidence to back up that claim because I don't believe that it's true. I'm not inclined to give that the benefit of the doubt until I have a reason to think otherwise. So, the reason that I want you to address the opposition first is that until I hear you, or until, until I see that you acknowledge that there's another side to this argument and can address that in some way, and until, until that's covered, it's in the back of your reader's mind. Like, yeah, but, okay, and here's another reason why you think you're right, yeah, but, okay, and here's a third reason why you think you're right, yeah, but, have you considered? And if you get down to it at the end, which is another way to do it, and by the way, it's, a, it's basically writing it as a concession, um, that is a perfectly reasonable form of argumentation. It's a respected style. I don't like it because I've, I've been, it's, if I think about this like I'm reading an argument for something that I disagree with, I feel like I've spent the entire paper uh, sort of waiting for you to get around to addressing and refuting the other side, like my position, because I disagree with you. Uh, it's kind of like, let's say hypothetically that you are trying to convince somebody to uh, do something for you, to do you a favor, and you know they're probably not going to want to do it. You know, let's let's say that you're you're um, let's say that you want somebody to loan you money, but maybe you aren't really trustworthy with money or, you know, it's, it's kind of a, uh, I don't know, it's maybe a shifty situation or something. And you think this person really is going to need some convincing. Uh, so you want to address their, their worries about whether or not it's an okay situation really fast. Okay. It's sort of an, I know what you're thinking, but let me explain before you start with the big asks and the reasons why you want this money. Okay. So that's the reason that I suggest that you do it that way. Now I've read other papers and I actually put a paper up on Blackboard 
Um, it's called Homophobia in America. It is a particularly good paper, and the crux of the entire paper is an opposition and refutation point. It is uh, one that I helped student work on because she was very committed to this topic, and it's a topic that I know quite well. Um, does not affect me personally, but it was my sample argument to deal with logic and our constitutional laws. Um, and this was a student who was uh, just personally could see the argument, and uh, I don't know what the particular reason why this person chose this argument, but uh, the paper basically systematically deconstructs any and every uh, justification for outlawing uh, homosexual, homosexual marriage, homosexual marriage, wow, that's an archaic term, marriage equality in the United States. Um, basically taking everything from the Constitution's, uh, I believe it's Fourth Amendment, uh, right to equal protection under the law, and bouncing that off of virtually any any justification that any of the states or any officials have ever used to say, well, you know, two men or two women should not have the right to get married in uh, Kentucky or, um, you know, other states that had banned it. Uh, please read that essay. It handles this issue of addressing opposition better than most ever uh, have done. So I put it up there for you. It is, uh, there's no name attached to it as any would have would do that. So that's a great sample. All right, so addressing the opposition, uh, you have to address it in some way. And you need to present the other side. You need to present an opposing argument and then refute it. So you need to write out both why someone may disagree with your point and why they are wrong, basically. You have to be effective about this and you have to be polite about it. You can't attack the other side. And it can't ever be uh, an argument that attacks them. It has to explain why that opposition argument is incorrect. You have to be polite. You have to be effective. So no simple appeals to emotion or attacking those who disagree with you. You're not Donald Trump. Um... If you think about the way that Donald Trump argues as his cases, or the way that he actually uh, deals with other people, whatever he's doing, do the opposite, and you probably have good argumentation techniques, because his are usually terrible. All right, some arguments won't have a direct opposition. So if you're arguing, for example, that uh, we need to donate to this charity, or you need to argue that, for example, um, New York State needs to increase funding for shelters uh, for victims of domestic violence. The opposition for this is not going to be the direct opposite, that New York State should not have shelters for domestic violence victims, that, that you know, we should kick them out of those shelters. Okay? No one believes that. All right? Um... There's, there's not, you, you can't come up with a, a sort of barbaric situation and then say that that's bad because it's horrible. Well, obviously, it's also a straw man. It's not a real argument. But the opposition, in this case, would most appropriately be a claim that New York spends enough money on these shelters already and we have limited funding. And so... You know, we, we really don't have more to spend, and we already spend enough. And then you have to then refute that by finding perhaps the actual numbers spent, and then maybe throw maybe compl comparing that to the actual need and saying it isn't enough. That would be more effective. You can always ask, ask for help with this. Uh, some arguments are easier to write than others. And, of course, there's strength and weakness in every reason why you want to handle this thing. 
Uh, one of the reasons that I'm really, really pushing for you to use the Opposing Viewpoints uh, database, the Gale Opposing Viewpoints database from the school's online uh, virtual library, is that I want you to read professional writing in this. And if you read those, you're going to see from both sides of your argument, uh, you know, from both sides of the issue, you're going to see how other people have taken on this issue in some cases. Um, you're also going to get exposed to a lot more professional writing. Now, I can throw a couple of sample student essays at you, but you're still dealing with people who were writing for composition class. When you read real researched articles on your topic, you are reading professional, published, in many cases, peer edited arguments and articles uh, that are written in some tremendously good language. You are reading effective argument, but you're also reading great language use. You're looking at the way these authors use their words and their word choice. So this makes you a better writer because writing and reading are linked. If you don't read anything other than comments on YouTube videos, you're going to be a lousy writer and there's just no way around it. Okay? Uh, it's not that I think, I mean, most of you are actually getting to be very good writers, but the more that you read, the better you're going to be. But it's going to reflect the kind of things that you read. So if you read garbage, you're going to produce garbage. If you read good quality professional language, you're going to write more inclined to that language. Um, I've talked before about how I have a learning disability. Um, I'm a dyslexic and it takes me a longer time to read uh, to read work than it does other people. It's part of why with everything going around going on with um, uh, switching all these classes to online classes, I'm I, I have not gotten through your previous essays as quickly as I should have. Uh, I'm not happy about that, but that's where things are. Um, it's taking me a longer time because I have to do so much additional reading and additional work to try to, you know, learn how to do other things. Um, I'm sorry. I would like to have done better. Um, I didn't really get the time to get things set up properly before I really had to stay away from campus. Um, um, so there we are. But I'm getting through things now, and um, you're going to have those back or have the... You're going to have the results of those essays uh, back very quickly. So when I ask you to read through some of the research on this topic, it's not just to find useful quotes to try to prove a point you already know about. It's actually to expose you to that language. If you read through Rebecca Cox's book for the previous, uh, for the previous essay and didn't just quote mine it, you got exposed to the way that uh, Dr. Cox uses language. And really, it's very good writing. So that's something that I really want you to get into with this. I understand that you have a lot of other work to do. And believe me, I'm being very flexible with deadlines here, partially because I know that this transition is not something that you were expecting. And I know it's very difficult for a lot of people. I want to help you in every way that I can, but I also want you to get what you paid for. And this is how you get it. So please don't skimp on it, even if it takes you a little bit longer to do it. Okay? Reach out, ask for help. Tell me if you're struggling or if you can't do something that, uh, you know, maybe I set it up wrong or, you know, there's some issue if Blackboard is, is not behaving properly or something along that line. If you're just struggling with this stuff, it is okay to ask for help, all right? You're not going to bother me, okay? I had somebody ask if, if, if they were being too much of a burden. It's like, no, 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 please, 
okay? Because this is why I'm here, all right? Don't let me get bored. Look at where I live. Think about where, where I go and what I do when I'm not teaching you. So, um, do take a look at that. I did send you, and some of you guys have gotten back to me, some of you guys haven't. I did send you the two sample support paragraphs. Uh, one is rather good, and the other one is rather bad. Now, I wanted you to take a look at the way that the first one proved its point and the structure therein. I'm going to, on Tuesday, send you a breakdown of what the different elements of that paragraph actually are. So you'll have that to back up as well. Um, I'm not going to bother with the second paragraph for that because it's a, a nightmare of um, chaos, pop culture references, and it just misspellings. Uh, it's it. They are both, however, English 101 paragraphs from papers used with student permission. Uh, so be aware of that. If you haven't gotten a chance to, to look that over, or if when you hear this, you say, oh, I never got that because something. Um, look for it on Blackboard. Let me know if you can't find it, and I'll be happy to send you a copy. All right, so um, I think I'm going to move on to logical fallacies, and uh, we'll make this just a longer video. Feel free to pause or stop here if you need to and pick up the rest of the video uh, a little bit later. Do make sure that you do check out the rest of it if you do that. This is a great time. Pause. And we're back. Okay, so when I say logical fallacies, uh, what I'm talking about are basically claim errors that undermine the logic of your argument. Uh, and I'm getting uh, the some of the language that I'm using here. I decided not to reinvent the wheel and rewrite my own definitions of things. Uh, so I'm getting a lot of my language from Purdue Owl. Uh, so you're seeing that I'm actually even documenting my sources here. Um, You'll see a lot of logical fallacies in things like advertising, politics, uh, things like that. Uh, lots of logical fallacies will show up in politics and political ads. Um, and they'll, in some cases, they seem to be effective arguments on the surface until you start thinking about it a little bit closer. Uh, some of them, some of them don't take a lot to sort out what the problem is. Some of them are pretty clearly, pretty clearly right out there and just not not good arguments by themselves. When you use logical fallacies, it questions kind of your whole argument all at once. Uh, so they are something you definitely want to avoid. Um, however, part of the reason that I want to spend some time on this. And then I want you to pay attention to it, and I'm going to post a couple of other videos about this because uh, you may have some of these may be a little bit different ways to say things, and they they may catch your eye in a way that this part of this video may not. So I'll put up a couple of videos, uh, or I'll, I'll post a couple of other people's videos about logical fallacies to see if that uh, helps you as well. Um, most of the time, they tend to either distract from the argument or they make completely illegitimate claims that don't prove what the author implies that they approve. So, for example, uh, you know, and again, all these notes will be put up on Blackboard. I'm not going to read every single one of these, but I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with a couple of them to give you an idea as to what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the... One of the ones that you see an awful lot right now is called an ad hominem attack. And it's an ad hominem fallacy. Um, this is where you attack the character or some quality of the person making the claim rather than 
the claim itself. So, for example, uh, Donald Trump is very eager to reopen the country. He wants to get us all back to work. Um, and I can understand why he wants that. However, he's a jerk. He's a complete dick. Uh, he is fat and orange, and he talks like an utter imbecile. And I just don't think he's that smart. I mean, he's, he's, he, listen to the way he talks. You know, I mean, he's, he's using like these, these just like one syllable word. Um, and he just kind of gives me the impression that he's just, he's just mean to everybody. And, and I think he's just kind of a, a big moron. Okay. He's, he's just, he's just stupid. He's stupid. He's a dummy. So he's clearly wrong about, uh, us getting back to work and getting back to shopping and being around each other uh, quickly because because he's fat and and stupid I didn't say anything about his argument about his claim about but like why he wants to do this I just got mean towards him I, I didn't even address his reasons for doing any of this thing. I just attacked him personally. That's a fallacy. It's not a good argument. All right. So another one is, as I mentioned earlier, a straw man. Uh, that oversimplifies a an argument's viewpoint and then attacks attacks that other uh, hollow argument. So essentially what I'm doing with a straw man is that I'm going to build up a, a sort of a, a like a, a, uh, a caricature of that thing that is vaguely similar, but not really, to what it is that you're arguing. Um, essentially with a straw man... What I'm doing is, as opposed to just attack, as opposed to taking on something along the lines of an actual Republican idea, I'm creating a fake, just uber conservative, um, some some not real, genuine Republican who has thought anything out and actually has an intelligent reason for voting the way they vote. But I'm talking about some like. Uh, you know, idiot, redneck, Bible-thumping, um, gun-toting, uh, Yosemite Sam type of caricature of a person who then I can attack. I can attack that. You know, like, the, the guy probably is part of the Westboro Baptist Church or something like that. And, of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, nobody likes them, you know, which is a different fallacy altogether. But it's where we're going into an area where it's just it's it's way over the top and it's I'm attacking something that's totally different from maybe an argument that somebody actually made um a circular argument is another fallacy and uh, this basically is a restatement of an argument rather than actually pr actually proving it for example uh the one the one here is a little dated but uh, the one from uh, Purdue Owl is George Bush is a good communi communicator because he speaks effectively. There you go. Um, I know a lot of people who are great. They're, they're really speedy runners. They run really quickly because, because of how fast they run. Um, a slippery slope is an argument that if we start doing one thing, we're eventually going to lead to the worst possible result. So uh, this one, uh, the classic cases for this, and this showed up, this showed up a lot in the marriage equality arguments, uh, where people said that if, if we allowed gay men or uh, gay women to, to marry, Eventually, we were going to have people marrying their pets or people marrying their kids. Uh, people, people were going to marry lamps and computers. People wanted to, were going to eventually want to marry their cell phones. And then where would we be? 
You know, it's like, hang on a minute. Because none of that shit makes any sense. All right? Um, so a lot of these are, if you think about it, they're, they're not really worth, they're, they're not worthwhile arguments on any sort of a basis. And you can't throw those at anything that really is any good. So, um, other logical fallacies are things like, uh, fallacies based on popularity of something. Uh, if you have something where you can say, you know, nine out of ten dentists recommend this toothpaste. Okay, well, they're dentists. That's probably somewhat more reasonable. But if you just say that, like, this is the most popular toothpaste, it doesn't actually give us a reason to believe that it's the best toothpaste. So that shows up in advertising a lot. Uh, it may not be the healthiest. It might be the cheapest. Or it might be the tastiest or whatever else. Um, the fallacy of uh, the fallacy of, of, of false authority is another one that I think is very good. And that one you've got to be really careful about because you need to ask, this goes back to some of the research questions that I've asked you. Ask if the speaker has the authority to make the claim that they're making. So famously, um, famously we've had people making claims that, uh, for example, um, let's see, uh, vaccinations cause autism. Now that's problematic on several different levels. Uh, the first place they don't. Uh, getting your kids vaccinated causes longer life for your kids. It causes them to not die as quickly. It does not cause autism. All right. Um, uh, Jenny McCarthy, who was um, some sort of a celebrity, I guess she was uh, some musician or actress or something. I honestly know very little about Jenny McCarthy's career because I for the most part, don't really care about celebrities. Um, but Jenny McCarthy was, whatever she was, it was not a doctor. And Jenny McCarthy made this claim, uh, but because she was a celebrity, it caught on. And people sort of made the connection, said, okay, well, I heard about this because Jenny McCarthy said it, and now I believe that vaccines cause autism and a lot of people didn't get their kids vaccinated and a lot of kids got sick so why did you believe jenny mccarthy where did she get her medical license all right uh i think i mentioned this before when we were talking about advertising i was talking about research that you know um I don't know anything about sports. Don't listen to me about sports, okay? But I'm not a celebrity, okay? Uh, so that's really the case. Uh, we run into this actually quite a bit right now with Donald Trump. His medical professionals, uh, the doctors around him, are saying one thing and he's saying another. Well, if you're talking about a pandemic, do you want to listen to the doctors or do you want to listen to the orange guy who's only thinking about the stock market because he believes that, well, pers first of all, that's the only way that he actually, outside of, you know, <laughs> outside of the presidency, that's the only thing that he does. It's the only thing that he actually gives a damn about is the stock market. It's his money there. Uh, his hotels aren't bringing anybody else in. So... Um, it's stock that he cares about. And the stock market's tanking. So he wants everybody back to work. Except that will hurt people. That may kill, get people killed. Lots of them. So I'm not going to listen to the big orange guy. Not because... And, and it's not that I'm not listening to him because he's fat or mean or any of the other stuff that I said earlier. I'm not listening to him because he's saying one thing, but 
his doctors are saying another thing. So it's a false authority with which he's speaking. He doesn't know what his doctors know. He doesn't know what medical professionals know. And I'm going to listen to the medical professionals. So, um, logical fallacies will kill your argument. And I want you to stay away from those. So when you're writing this paper, uh, I do want you to do enough research, one, that you actually see how these things play out. Now, when you do this research, I don't want you to just try to find someone who's already proving your point for you. Instead, what I want you to do is to do enough research on your topic that you can, you can prove your topic. So, for some of you, you will find people saying similar things. That's great. But just because you can't find somebody who's actually writing the same paper that you are doesn't mean you should change topics or anything. It means that you can find evidence to back up your own original claim. It means that you're actually in a position to write your own original paper, which is actually a lot cooler than trying to basically copy somebody else's. That doesn't mean that you have to. What I'm saying is you're in an interesting and good position. Okay? So I want you to do this research. I want you to actually read some of this. This does not necessarily mean you need to read through every single word. Skimming is a thing. But don't just quote mine these things. Read them. Read the way that your articles argue their points. Uh... Look for the way that they use language. Avoid logical fallacies. Do address the opposition and refute it. Look at the tools that are made available for you and do ask for help if you need it. Okay? Uh, we'll talk about documentation in another video, but you can and should always look this up on Purdue OWL. Um, the MLA guide does break down how to document things like uh, newspaper articles, um, magazines, scholarly journals, a lot of the stuff. You can do some of this legwork on your own. And it is always, always okay to send something to me and say, look, am I doing this right? You're not plagiarizing if you send me something and ask how to do it. That that can't be used against you. Make sense? Awesome. All right. This has been a long video. I appreciate you guys sticking through it. It is fine if you broke it up. Uh, but this is good stuff, and I really want you to succeed. Uh, stay safe out there, everybody. Do not hesitate to let people know if you are sick or if you're taking care of somebody who's sick because that that's going to have an impact on whether or not you're, you're able to do things here. Um, I don't want you to get a failing grade because you got sick and couldn't do something like, you know, this paper doesn't come in or something like that. Uh, don't use it as an excuse, but, you know, stay safe, stay healthy, keep in touch as much as you can. I know some of you guys are really good about that. Some people I haven't heard from in a couple of weeks, and I know that you're working and doing other things, but just a quick line that just says, hey, hey don't write me off. Don't don't forget about me, Martin. It's like, I, I, I'm trying not to. Uh, I reached out to everybody. Um, only a handful of people wrote me back. All right. Take care of yourselves. Have a good day. Write. Show me things. All right. Take care.